Holy God, whose Spirit comes to us in moments of both strength and weakness, come now into our midst that we might be able to hear your word in fullness and in truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of James, and this is uh, two passages from chapter 2. We begin in verse 5. James writes, Listen, my dear brothers, God chose the poor people of this world to be rich in faith and to possess the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. But you dishonor the poor. Who are the ones who oppress you and drag you before the judges? The rich. They are the ones who speak evil of that good name which has been given to you. My brothers, what good is it for someone to say that he has faith if his actions do not prove it? Can that faith save him? Suppose there are brothers or sisters who need clothes and don't have enough to eat. What good is there in your saying to them, God bless you, keep warm and eat well, if you don't give them the necessities of life? So it is with faith. If it is alone and includes no actions, then it is dead. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, and this is chapter 14, uh, beginning in verse 7. Jesus noticed how some of the guests were choosing the best places, so he told this parable to all of them. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place. It could happen that someone more important than you has been invited. And your host, who invited both of you, would have to come and say to you, let him have this place. Then you would be embarrassed and have to sit in the lowest place. Instead, when you're invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that your host will come to you and say, come on up, my friend, to a better place. This will bring you honor in the presence of all the other guests. For everyone who makes himself great will be humbled, and everyone who humbles himself will be made great. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a lunch or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and in this way you will be paid for what you did. When you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed, because they are not able to pay you back. God will repay you on the day the good people rise from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Um, <clears throat> some of you may know who Sidney Bertram Carter was. While others may be familiar with some of his work, uh, you've never heard his name before. Carter was an English poet, songwriter, and folk musician who died in 2004. And he is surely best known for a beautiful hymn he composed in the 1960s titled, Lord of the Dance whose music is based on the Shaker song, Simple Gifts. Dance then, wherever you may be, I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all, wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all, in the dance, said he. Sound familiar? Yeah. Well, I bring up Sidney Carter this morning for one of his lesser known songs. <laughs> <laughs> and that song is called, When I Needed a Neighbor. And it's derived from two well-known passages of Scripture, Matthew 25 and Luke 10, the judgment of the sheep and the goats, and the parable of the Good Samaritan, respectively. 
And the premise of the song is to ask the rhetorical questions that Jesus posed in that scene regarding whether people fed him or gave him water or visited him when he was sick. But it takes it just a bit further because by using the word neighbor, it also reminds the listener of that uncomfortable time when one of the scribes asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied with a parable that teaches our neighbor is truly anyone. And when we put the two concepts together, Carter's hymn suggests that to love Jesus means to be willing to love and be prepared to love everyone. And to love anyone is nothing less than to love Jesus. The opening stanza of the song goes like this. He says, when I needed a neighbor... Were you there? Were you there? When I needed a neighbor, were you there? And the creed and the color and the name won't matter. Were you there? It's a powerful song. But I can't help but think of another text when I hear it, and that's our reading from St. James this day. And that's because no matter how you approach it, Regardless of what angle you take, in spite of whatever spin you try to put on it, our faith in and love for Jesus Christ cannot be severed in any way, shape, or form from how we treat our neighbors. And not just the ones that look or live or think like us, but the ones who struggle most mightily with the most basic aspects of life, the hungry and the homeless and the sick and the imprisoned, the widow, the orphan, the foreigner. This is why this morning's text is the next to last meditation in our series on the characteristics of a biblical church. Because we need to focus on the church as the caretaker of the least of these. And that in itself is actually an interesting turn of phrase because Jesus himself tells us that whatever we do for the least of these, we do for him. And yet, in making such a statement, which is bolstered by the entirety of his life and ministry and the manner in which he interpreted the law and the prophets from the Hebrew scriptures, we quickly realize that the least of these are in reality the greatest in the eyes of God. James, the Lord's brother, spells this out when he says, God chose the poor people of this world to be rich in faith and to possess the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. In the church, this has sometimes been referred to as the preferential option for the poor. And that's just the idea that there's this trend that exists throughout the Bible of priority being given to the well-being of the poor and the powerless of society and all the teaching and commands of God, as well as those of the prophets and other righteous individuals. But unfortunately, we don't always spend a lot of time talking about this in certain circles. I don't mean to step on toes, but one of those circles where we don't always hear enough about this is in more conservative and evangelical ones. And I think the primary reason for this is because when you start talking about matters of justice regarding the weak or the marginalized, there are some people who like to employ certain dog whistles, if you will. Terms like the social gospel or social justice. And they do this to not so discreetly suggest that these are just liberal concepts invented by folks in the postmodern era to shift the Christian faith away from Jesus and onto various political ideologies and philosophies. Now, it is certainly a fair observation to say that many Christian leaders who have moved away from orthodox teachings about the divinity of Christ or the primacy of Scripture, among other things, will also be individuals who strongly emphasize the teachings of the Bible as they pertain to caring for the poor and marginalized. That is true, but it is not a reason for throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And if our text this morning, along with many others of a similar nature, point to anything, 
They teach that when a person attempts to tell you that someone can profess a saving relationship with Jesus Christ while also choosing to ignore everything he said about caring for the least of these, the only appropriate response to them is, Get behind me, Satan. One of our readings speaks directly about how the individual Christian is supposed to embody this understanding. The other draws the camera focus back, so to speak, to encompass the broader picture of God's kingdom and why it's so important to live this way. The first is written by the leader of the initial community of believers in Jerusalem to teach them from the very beginning of this new movement why it's important how they live in Christ. And the second is a teaching that comes from the lips of Jesus himself and glimpses a new reality that the church is to bear witness to today as we await its complete fulfillment at a future time. In other words, to put it simply, the one tells us what to do and the other tells us why. So let's dive in a little deeper. James makes an example of those who are in need of clothes or food. Very practical matters that we don't need to look very hard to find around us in our world today. Be it folks that are lined up on Tuesday morning at God's storehouse to receive the food boxes like we're currently collecting for, or people that are buying outfits for 25 cents down at the Henderson Settlement thrift store in Kentucky because they can't afford to dress their children for the school year by shopping at the Walmart 30 miles away. You have individuals who are literally starving to death in countries on other continents, and then you have the victims of natural disasters who've escaped with the clothing on their backs and nothing else. It is not difficult to locate men and women and children who need assistance in meeting these daily needs. And in my mind, this is part of the genius of James' approach to the matter, because James doesn't speak in the abstract. Like, say, John does in one of his epistles when he writes, He who says he loves God, who he cannot see, but doesn't love his brother or sister, who he can see, is a liar. Now, John's right, of course. But, like the scribe who first hears the parable of the Good Samaritan, his terms are open to a certain degree of interpretation. And that leads to people trying to create loopholes. I mean, what does it mean to love, for example? James doesn't leave the door open for any of that. (laughs) James gives a concrete example, and he minces no words. He says, are they naked? Are they hungry? It's an inescapable scenario that rings as realistic 2,000 years later as it was in first century Jerusalem. And I particularly appreciate translations like the one I read this morning, because you can still, if you really want to be difficult, Obscure terms like naked or hungry, as we sometimes do by spiritualizing them. (laughs) Think of the ways we sometimes try to get out of the Beatitudes when we don't really want to change how we live. But translations like we used this morning that say, suppose there are brothers or sisters who need clothes or don't have enough to eat. It's cut and dry. It's nothing to confuse, twist, or duck around. And this is where it can get just a little offensive. Because, frankly, the Bible is not saying anything it hasn't already said to us dozens of times before, but James says it one more time, and perhaps in one of the most direct ways. In effect, he reminds readers, if we see someone in need and we don't act, we can shut up. Because to that extent, our faith is dead. I know, it's rough. It's convicting. It's true. Mind you, James isn't suggesting that any of us alone can possibly respond to even a fraction of the desperate needs around us. This isn't supposed to be setting us up for some kind of guilt trip. But it's reminding us that we can and we should, whenever we encounter some nature of suffering or injustice or struggle in the lives of our neighbors, ask ourselves, am I contributing to this problem? actively or passively, by doing the wrong things or just doing nothing at all? Or am I striving in the spirit to contribute to the solution? Because just speaking and not reflecting the conviction and how we live our lives is not evidence of faith. 
It's evidence of the parts of ourselves that are not yet fully regenerated and await further sanctification. It's evidence of the part of our faith that remains dead, awaiting resurrection through Christ and the Holy Spirit. What John preaches in more spiritual terms, James preaches in the practical. And this strange and profound idea that our actions should bring to life that which our lips profess goes far beyond a meal or a winter coat. A traditional teaching in the church dating back almost a thousand years is something illustrated on the front of your bulletin this morning. It's known as the corporal works of mercy. And they're called corporal because they refer to the physical well-being of a person. There's also seven spiritual works of mercy, like admonishing the sinner and forgiving offenses. And these are all primarily taken from the same Matthew 25 text as Carter's hymn. But these are the seven. To feed the hungry. To give water to the thirsty. To clothe the naked. To shelter the homeless. To visit the sick to visit the imprisoned or ransom the captive, and to bury the dead. These are tangible ways in which the church acts out the faith she professes. This is not liberal theology and it isn't salvation based on works. This is the reality that as a people saved through Jesus Christ from an eternity separate from God, i.e. hell, we can offer no other reasonable response than to be obedient to his commands. And he says, feed the hungry, give water to the thirsty, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, visit the sick and imprisoned. And for the third Sunday in a row, I'll remind us all that grace is not opposed to earning. It's opposed, I'm sorry, it's opposed to earning. It is not opposed to effort. Our accountability to this idea can take many different forms, but we have to personally reflect on it, and we have to be accountable to one another regarding it. I actually find it helpful to keep the list of the works in my Bible, and I look at it on a regular basis, and I ask myself, what have I done recently that can truthfully be said to fulfill these acts? And sometimes the answer is crystal clear. Like if I've literally been in the prison that day or I've just come home from visiting somebody at the hospital that afternoon, that's easy. And other times I have to think more carefully. Plenty of times it can be embarrassing how few examples I have to cite. But however we choose to approach it, every Christian needs to be looking at their lives through this lens. And more importantly, every church needs to collectively reflect on its ministries in their light. Because if our individual faith apart from action is dead, what does that say about a church without substantial action? Now, as I said, James points us more towards what we have to do regarding the least of these, but the reading from Luke tells us why we have to do it. And it's an interesting parable that's short, sweet, and nonetheless, deeper than the ocean. So on one level, it sounds like very pragmatic advice, followed by something just as direct, but perhaps maybe a little more out there. The first half offers a reasonable solution. It says, when you're invited to a shindig, don't assume you're the biggest VIP there. It says, sit in a less prominent seat, because everybody knows it's better to be publicly complimented than to be corrected in front of others, right? The second half seems a little less sensical, but it's still clear-cut. Jesus says, when you throw the party, don't invite a bunch of friends or relatives or people who can repay your invitation. Rather, invite those who are incapable of reciprocating, the poor, the lame, the crippled. Now, this would sound kind of foolish, because who wants to miss out on a perfectly good opportunity for leveraging kindness in exchange for personal gain? I rub your back and you rub mine. But what's interesting is Jesus doesn't even call that out as a bad or selfish desire. Instead, he says, look, what you think you have to gain from inviting these other folks, I promise you, if you invite the widow, the orphan, the foreigner, my father will make it all the more worth your while. This is the first hint 
that what Jesus is saying is meant to go far beyond the realm of this present reality. The second hint comes from the imagery he uses, that of a banquet or a wedding feast. This is something that's conveyed from the first to the last book of Scripture as a place where we glimpse God's plan and his works. From the great feast that Abraham throws when Isaac is weaned in Genesis all the way to the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation. The third hint, if you still think I'm stretching this a bit, comes in the very next verse from where we stopped in the reading. It says, When one of the men sitting at the table heard this, he said to Jesus, How happy are those who will sit down at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus' parable is a picture of a kingdom reality. Jesus is beginning to blur the lines between the concrete that James speaks of and the promises of God's kingdom, whose Christ, whose arrival Christ has been announcing since the first day of his public ministry. Why is this important? I'm so glad you asked that question. And the answer is twofold. Firstly, that preference that God has, that unique compassion and love for the least of these, which James cites and the prophets declared, it's affirmed right here from the very mouth of Jesus. He says that the kingdom is a place where we are to focus on the inclusion of the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind. It's not a place where the doors are to be barred to the undesirables, but rather a place where we're called to positions of service so that they might be invited to positions of honor. <clears throat> Notice the Bible doesn't tell us that the poor should become more financially responsible and then they can be invited to the banquet. It doesn't say that the prisoner must do their time and experience complete rehabilitation before they're invited to the banquet. No, it says we're supposed to go to them as they are and say, God loves you. And we love you. And we're committed to demonstrating that through our actions. It's kind of like, I don't know, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. He didn't just feel something. He didn't just say something. He did something for the least of us. And Jesus tells us that we must do these things for the least of these. But the other reason this understanding of Jesus' parable as it relates to the kingdom matters is because it means that living in this manner, showing concern and love for the weak and the marginalized, regardless of the ways in which such a priority might be interpreted politically or socially, doing this is to offer a window into the kingdom of heaven itself through which the world might look upon what God desires for it. When the church lives this image with a lukewarm commitment and wishy-washy actions, the world sees a people who talk too much and don't do enough to escape the label of hypocrisy. But when she lives this image with consistency and conviction, the gates of hell cannot prevail against her. It's not lost on me that the last part of this chapter, after the two feast parables, is where Jesus teaches on the cost of being a disciple when he says, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And this is appropriate because what pure example is there of inviting people to a feast for which they can never repay you than Christ's invitation to his heavenly banquet through the sacrifice of his own life at Calvary. Do not misunderstand or underestimate the power of that sort of witness when it is lived out wholeheartedly by the people of God. Matt Crawford offers an excellent example from a long time ago in church history. He writes, famine and war had recently afflicted the city of Caesarea, so when the plague hit in the fourth century, so about 300 years after the death of Christ, the populace was already weakened and unable to withstand the additional blow, and they began fleeing the city, one of the larger ones in the Roman Empire, mind you, for the safety of the countryside. However, in the midst of the fleeing inhabitants, at least one group was staying behind, 
the Christians. And as a bishop of the city and historian of the early church, Eusebius recorded this in the church history of the plague. He said, all day long, some of them, the Christians, tended to the dying in their burial, countless numbers with no one to care for them, and others gathered together from all parts of the city, a multitude of those withered from famine, and distributed bread to them all. And Eusebius goes on to state that because of their compassion in the midst of the plague, the Christians' deeds were on everyone's lips, and they glorified the God of the Christians. Such actions convinced them that they alone were pious and truly reverent to God. And just a few decades after Eusebius, the last pagan emperor, Julian the Apostate, recognized the Christian practice of compassion was what caused the transformation of the faith from a small movement on the edge of the empire to cultural ascendancy. He wrote to a pagan priest and said, when it came about the poor were neglected and overlooked by our priests, then I think the impious Galileans, the Christians, observed this fact and devoted themselves to philanthropy. They supported not only their poor, but ours as well. And all men saw that they lacked aid from us. You see, that kind of impact through obedient witness is possible because Scripture tells us that faith as tiny as a mustard seed is capable of moving mountains, but only if that faith isn't dead. In Sidney Carter's hymn, he moves from that opening stanza where he sings, When I Needed a Neighbor, through four others, where I was hungry and naked, to where I needed a healer. And each time he asked, were you there? But then in the sixth and final stanza, he makes that magnificent turn that only a gifted songwriter is capable of. And he writes, wherever you travel, I'll be there, I'll be there. Wherever you travel, I'll be there. And the creed and the color and the name won't matter. I'll be there. And it's only at that point that the listener recognizes we've been hearing the voice of Christ the entire time. He was the one who needed a neighbor. Hungry, thirsty, naked, in need of shelter and healing. He awaits us in every person anywhere who lives today with these realities. Brothers and sisters, what good is it for someone to say that they have faith if their actions do not prove it? Can that faith save them? Brother, everyone who humbles themselves will be made great, and you will be blessed because they're not able to pay you back. But God will repay you. Truthfully, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has done nothing less than repay us in advance. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.